built 800 birds from the ground up, I'd like you to tell me the value of community and how you can build it organically. Especially, this is a, I assume this is a valuable asset for anyone who's building a grassroots uh, conference or event or series of events. So, so um, BB and, and Ben talk about you know paid conference, big conferences, and you know they, they are very very hard to pull up. For me, it's a meetup. I've been doing this for three and a half years and uh, totally organic. And for me, doing the kind of community event, and many, how many of you have come to my event? I had a few, Ernie, a bunch of people come to my event. My event was different because for me personally, I want my audience to be part of the actions. I never like the, the, the meetup or conferences where you know, all speakers are sitting here up high and no interaction at all. That's just not the community for me. So <laughs> I always told my speakers, my invited speakers, I said, hey, listen, I don't care how they I mean, you know, one time I invited the senior VP of Zynga, you know, Mark Skid. I said, listen, uh, in my event, was different from others. My audience, I told them in email, is as important as you. I told my speakers about that. So I want a lot of interactions about that. So my event was known to be very interactive. I, that's why I have a lot of global people, you know, people from Finland, from Greece, from Spain, come to my event. I always try to remember their name during the networking. I say, okay, tell me what you're doing, you know, one minute. And they got really excited from all over the world, and they never expected they'll come to Silicon Valley first, their English is out, but they get to speak about their things. And that kind of pop participation just embed in their memory. And they get to be making friends, because other people, when they talk, somebody talk about the, the app or, or startup is building something, say, oh, I know somebody, let me, you know, I'll introduce you afterwards. So there's tremendous interactions in my event. And I told the audience also, do not come to my event exchange business card. I said, you want to come to my event, make real friends. I don't buy that about that. So don't come here to exchange business. And that happened, Corinne, keep nodding. I think I get that, um, because, and then I build that uh, community sense. So it's always word of mouth. I, I've got multiple people told me, said, surely you do the most, the best event, uh, free event, because I never charge people. And Pillsbury is sponsor on my event. People would tell me, I said, no, no, there are a lot of good events. But they would say they, they, it stick in their memory how much they enjoy and the friendship they build. Even after they went back to their countries, they just stayed as friends. And I get a lot of satisfaction with that. I do a lot of business trip to China. It was the same way I build a relationship there. And then people, and I moderate panels in mobile gaming event in China a lot. And I always try to engage the audience, whether they put me on the big stage in the big conference, I engage. I would ask questions, I would engage my, my audience that way. And I think that people want to be part of it. And I think that, 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 that that's a satisfaction that I get from that. No, it's, it's very true, it's absolutely true about the, the, the potential to build organic community connections, almost familial in a way, everyone knows everyone else through building, through relationship building. Now, for a larger scale conference like GDC, is it possible to create that same sense of community? I mean, I, there's a lot of uh, reunions, you know, they, people come back to GDC, it becomes a family, mm -hmm. especially with IGDA and other groups. Do you see, um, do you see other, do you see it as something you have to facilitate, or is it not reach a point of its own momentum? I mean, after being around so many years. Um, probably a combination of both. I mean, it definitely, some of the more uh, mature groups, IGDA, stuff like that, they do a good job of reaching their own community and they stay connected. We certainly create space, we make sure there's space within the conference that allows for that. Uh, we're seeing it pop up more now that indies are a big deal mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of networking that needs to take place with that and so we're figuring out how can we create space as well within. Um, it's definitely important. We're pretty fortunate because Gama Sutra is part of um, one of our online products, so we get to hear a lot of those conversations that are taking place online, and we keep an ear open and we listen to kind of what's being said or what's being needed, and we make sure when we do our strategy and setting the tone and thinking about um, how we're going to map out our space and stuff, that we're listening to those conversations and that we're trying to meet those needs because 
if we didn't have this community, we wouldn't have GDC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there is a fellowship so of let me, let me sort of put a pregnant pause on everything. This is a really lovely conversation about some really big stuff, and it's really fantastic. I'd like to know from each of you, how, do, how can one socialize their experience through social media? And so what I mean by that is so right now, can you take that camera? Um, no, actually, you can put it on there. Okay. <laughs> what are some of the, the tools out there? So when you look at like um, the tweet wall at uh, conferences, what are some of the tools or products out there or Bizabo that we can use to activate a social experience, incorporate, envelop, can so I? that people feel a little bit more skin in the game, mm -hmm. a little bit more ownership. From, from the PR standpoint, for me, it's more buzz, virality, all of that. But all of these sort of, so the question is about tools yeah. that are out there. Can you actually speak to that? Because I think a lot of people would might want to, I actually want to know about that. Okay. Can I start with a real obvious one that not and I mean that organizers use? Right so go ahead. Very yeah. obvious one that I like a lot that event organizers still don't use enough, which is Facebook groups. Yes. Because everyone is effing already there, and everyone gets a damn notification. But more importantly, after an event, and if people are invited and they are on the Facebook group, you'll be shocked. People will engage. They'll start posting things, asking for help. I have it still happen. It's actually the ones based off events are actually my most useful Facebook groups because I met the people rather than, you know, big ass large group that people who like, you know, chickens, I don't know. But make a Facebook group afterwards and invite people and let them go talk and then you can make them feel, they build community and then you have an instant place to announce the next one. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I just use Facebook. I don't even create, you know, a lot. And Eventbrite. So Facebook is awesome because uh, it has a lot of features to support that. I think it was maybe three years ago they took out a feature where you can email to the people who sign up or invite, sort of, through Facebook messaging. They took that out. And then for event organizer, I thought that was a, a big, you know, uh, disappointment. However, I use uh, Facebook and I use Eventbrite. Eventbrite's been getting really good because Eventbrite will send emails. Says, I constantly, I actually got trapped, so to speak. It was, I would get emails says, Paul and Kareem are going to this event. And I look at that event, okay, I know Paul usually go to what kind of event. I look at that event, I would sign up. I can't tell you how many times I do that. So that's another one. I don't use Twitter much, but uh, you know, on Facebook there's a GDC, it's called Fellowship of GDC Parties. And I've seen that thing, just organic viral growth in three weeks from 200 people when I sign in to 3,000 people. And the live just continue and the conversation going on on there. There's one thread a couple years ago about, you know, women, you know, in the after party. That thread has 150 conversations on there talking about social media compact, uh, impact. And I myself created a Google I.O. party, you know, using it as a party central. But it's really to continue the conversation. To me, that's extremely effective. I'll both agree and disagree that, yeah, mm -hmm. Facebook is obviously a ubiquitous platform for, you know, our community here in Silicon Valley and, you know, with our demographic. But there's also a lot of major corporate or professional events. They're not very Facebook-centric at all. They're more LinkedIn-centric. Okay, so it's, it's more of a professional community, and now LinkedIn has a very powerful social feed as well that a lot of people are using. It's a different type of content. It's more professionally oriented and more around learning and growing your career and things like that. So just to, to answer Sean's point or question is, I like events that, that give their communities different ways to engage because they're different people like to choose, they have their favorite tools about engaging. Um, BB mentioned about having a mobile event app. Yeah, obviously I'm a big proponent of that. But it's not just about having an app, it's having the right app, it's setting it up correctly, but it's also promoting it. Because I've been to several events where, you know, they, they do a lot of work to set it up, but then they don't promote it and then nobody, nobody knows about it. And these tools are extremely powerful in terms of giving the attendees the ability to socialize the event as well. So, like for example, in Bisbo, when you join the community, 
join the, the event community so you can start networking with people there, you know, before the event or, or targeting your networking. You have the option of sharing that with your social networks, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. That, that actually gives the event some additional credit, some additional, you know, social credit and some additional buzz. Launch, launch Festival, for example, they had about a thousand people in their mobile event community, but they got roughly 680,000 social media impressions from the shares that the people did. So the, the idea is, again, give your, give your audience and your constituencies a lot of different tools to engage. The audience to engage with the speakers, you know, for asking questions, um, sharing on your social networks, the ability to network, the ability to, you know, give the organizers feedback about the event. There's so many different channels and so many different tools out there. But it's about finding the right mix that's right for your particular community. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that's that's key. Could not agree more. Um, for us, Facebook is not our community, at least for the organizers. We realize we empower all of the attendees or people who are even fans. Maybe they don't attend every year. They select their own little groups. But we do it purely when on-site through, um, through our app. And we put out push notifications. We let people know. We remind them when the expo floor is getting ready to open. We remind them about a major post-mortem that we know is going to be a packed house. We remind them of different little things. And then just watch the feeds. We just, you know, we'll post pictures ourselves. And even behind the scenes ones so they can see what the staff is doing, stuff like that. We rev up probably a good six weeks before even the event. We start posting things. And we can't, we love hearing the chatter of, you know, T minus three weeks until I'm on a plane from wherever, Copenhagen to SFO, like things like that, which is really, really exciting. And we'll like them and we're not even afraid of staff to comment on that or to put a like and things like that. Part of it is engaging and not being afraid to really engage with your audience, even when on site. Even if it's things that you don't want to hear. We got feedback this year. Um, somebody didn't like something that was happening with the app and we were like, hey, thanks for the heads up. Let's see if we can fix this halfway through the week. And later that person was like, wow, you guys really do Listen, thank you. So, um, I don't know, Sean, if that answered your question on the yeah. things that we use. No, you took, uh, you took a couple of questions off my list. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, that's what I'm looking for. Um, no, I was wondering about, since you moved uh, GDC Austin to LA, as we were talking about, uh, just an example of when you relocate and you're starting all over again, how do you get that momentum back? And you're, you're building it, when you're taking a brand and you're rebranding it, rebuilding it? How do you promote it? How do you build a community for it? Um, it's really hard. Honestly, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's a tough decision to decide to pull the trigger on something that's still somewhat successful, but when it's time for it to leave. So we took, for those of you who don't know, we took GDC online, which was the Austin show, moved it to LA, um, changed everything about it, including the time of year. And um, rebranded it as GBC Next and launched it. And we decided to launch it as an inaugural event. We didn't even try to say, hey, online has evolved, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's just bullshit. And then your audience will sniff it a mile away, so why bother? And we had to think about why we were redoing it and communicate that out. I think that's probably um, one of the biggest things to helping uh, gain momentum, but also keeping the trust of the, the community that you already have established with is letting them know what's going on, why you're doing it, um, and listening to feedback. We're still growing that that event. Um, you know, we really had to say it's it's not GDC San Francisco, so not the same talks. It's really about next gen. It's more the think tank and the launch pad because GDCSF is so large now, and uh, it's a lot of data driven stuff. It's proven things. It's tips. It's tricks. It's how to how to be successful, how to monetize, blah, blah, blah. And this needed to be almost back to the roots of when GDC almost 30 years ago was in you know, someone's living room. <laughs> it was a lot about theory. And we realized that we weren't totally filling that niche yet. And then app developers. And we need to create a space for app developers. So I'd like to, uh, since we talked about the importance of community, I'd like to ask you, Ben, you know, how do you turn an attendee into an evangelist, into someone who pushes the conference for you and pushes the event for you. How do you how do you catalyze that interest and make it go a step further and using social tools or telling their friends what are the steps you would use, you know, borrow from capitology? Tell me a little well, bit about what you would do. A 
short answer to that would be rewards. Yeah. Um, a long answer is the right type of reward. And so I do an entire chapter on rewards and the reward system. Uh, there's a, um, when you're trying to especially turn people into evangelists, uh, because they need to have some kind of motivation to do it, right? Uh, now, everyone's probably heard of dopamine. You probably associate dopamine with uh, pleasure. Dopamine has nothing to do with pleasure. Dopamine has everything to do with motivation. It's actually a different system that gets triggered after dopamine that gives pleasure. And so, actually, they did one very random side one. They did a study where they took away all the dopamine from rats. And the rats could still feel pleasure when they drank sugar water and things like that. But they did not, they were so unmotivated that they wouldn't even go eat. That, if you took your dopamine away, you would, not, you would literally rather starve to death than eat and survive. That's how important it is. So your goal is to uh, give of someone a motivation to do it. Now, typically, most people do it by uh, you know, dangling a carrot, saying, like, you do this, we'll go give you a reward. Maybe it's a 10% discount if you go share out. It doesn't work because you're treating people like Pavlovian dogs. No one wants to be treated like a Pavlovian dog. Um, again, this goes back to what I was talking about surprise, which is you're just giving people serendipitous awards, achievements, or achievements. So, like, I interviewed Brian Long from Keep for the book, and uh, they actually, they did a lot of internal studies to try to figure out, you know, what kind of engagement do you have if you offer somebody a reward versus if you just give somebody an achievement that they don't expect. And the amount of uh, engagement you get is nearly double if you actually, if you do it as an achievement rather than as a reward. And so my suggestion is you just, you're just rewarding people, uh, you're giving people a reward as an achievement or as serendipitously. Um, little things over time for being involved in your community. And it doesn't have to be something monetary. It doesn't have to be something uh, like that. It can be something more intrinsically motivated. And so uh, people tend to follow, one, people tend to follow those that uh, they, the, they, can, they see the motivation in others, they tend to follow those people. Because they believe that if that person's so motivated that you get motivated, you, like it literally, it almost like rubs off on you, yeah. and this actually does happen generally. Yeah, yeah. There's an there's an effect. It, it's much stronger if they see if they see you being really engaged, really happy, really like thank you so much for being here, all that sort of thing. Like it, it it's genuine. It's much more motivated than saying like you get a ten percent discount if you share this thing out. Um, just give people like little little rewards here and there. Maybe it's a little note, maybe it's a little gift, maybe it's whatever, but if you do that more often, they become more loyal, and then you don't have to incentivize them to evangelize, they'll just go do it because they like you. Something highly targeted, highly personal, something they can relate to, is what you're talking about. It, I mean, it, yes, but also just anything that's serendipitous, like, just little things, like, yeah. it, the little things matter more than the big things, and I think that's been one major theme of this, the little things matter. The little things do matter. Well, when you yeah. talk about evangelizing, you're talking about the attendees evangelizing. Basically, you know, for spreading the, event. the word, right? You know, yeah. through social media or word of mouth. You know, in, well, in all the different ways that they're capable. You know, so. more more fundamental to that is give them a channel to do that, right. or you know, encourage them to do that, and then people will do that naturally because they want the world to know that they're going to the coolest event on the planet. You know, hey, I'm going to GDC, and so I want all my community. So just seeing that on the Twitter feed or the LinkedIn feed or Facebook, whatever, I mean, you know, that gives me some jazz. And, and that's what the social media impressions are all about that are coming out of the moment event app. And that's, that's why you need to encourage people to do that. Um, as far as, you know, then tapping into that, you know, deeper inner, that's you know, yeah, thing, yeah. that's... I mean, you make, make, it, make, it, make it super simple to yeah. share, yeah, like in the app, everywhere, so that they only have to click a button or two. They want to, not just to brag about it, but also to be like, I want to see which of my friends are going. That's why I share. I want to hear like, oh, so my friend will like tweet back at me, I'm going to that too. And then we'll be like, we're going to go get beers. So one, one of the coolest things I like about Eventbrite is they have this feature that, that um, says, you know, your three or four or five friends are going to this event and you get an email. And that's, that's how I find a good percentage of the events. A, a lot of problem is just, there's so many events and, you know, we're not all that peaked in, in you know, finding them. You know, it's how do you, how do you discover these? Event discovery is a big problem. So, I mean, whatever tools that can be used to help propagate in that way, I think is, is real helpful as well. Yeah, for me, it's a smaller scale, obviously, but, uh 
I think, as I said, you know, participation. People remember the best when they make friends, and then it's again, they totally evangelize. I can't tell you how many times I'd be walking on the street of Beijing or walking on the street of San Francisco. Somebody come up to me and say, oh, are you the one who organized 800 birds? And I said, how do you know? Oh, some of them, some somebody back in Finland told them, oh, when you go to San Francisco, you got to go to this event I'll meet up with you. I thought I'm not bragging about myself. The thing is that they feel so welcome, especially for startup from out of other states or even, you know, here. And they feel so welcome and what kind of friendship that build that lasts forever. I never really market myself. I'm so lazy. You know, I don't. I use Facebook and Vembrite. That's about it. But the kind of engagement and feeling so welcome and just stay forever throughout their life. I can't tell you how many. How many of you uh, organize events? Okay. How many of you, when you organize the event, you're hosting the event, you walk into the audience? You do that. You do that. You do that. I do that all the time. I would take my mic, walking to the audience all the way back, and I would pass a mic to people way in the back, because usually people in the back, they don't want to. I say, hey, I remember you come from uh, Finland or something. Tell us what you do. All of a sudden, like you said, you know, surprise. They feel they are part of it. They're important. They're not like nobody, you know, being hiding in the corner. So I get everybody in the audience to participate by really walking to it. I've been on the big stage of hundreds of hundreds of people. I took the mic and walking to my audience. I want everybody to participate in my audience. That's sure. just how we have to do Shirley, I think we're going to have to probably, we're about at the, the finishing point, I believe. So are we, are we there yet, Sean, or? Two more minutes. Two more minutes? Okay, let's give these guys a few more minutes. I'd like to rattle off a couple of quick uh, answers. Since we kind of, you know, uh, Ben kind of uh, pulled out the theme here, I'd like to tell me what you think the one major secret an aspiring event planner could use for what's that? What's that alchemic secret? What's that? What's that elixir? What's that secret thing that they should keep in mind that they can do to create and promote or to promote a great event? Starting with you, baby. Oh, secret elixir. Um, that one magic thing, the magic bullet. Uh, know, know your space, know your audience, know your space. Don't just think, oh, I'm going to launch this event, da, da You better know who your competitors are, you better know where do they go to get their information, how do they like to get information, do your homework, do your research, that probably is, I would say, is the budget bullet. you got to know your, your target, you can't just shoot it. That's a, that's a great summary to keep in mind, Shirley. Oh, I think the participation, again, I emphasize it over and over, it just be general. I want my audience to be part of it, to be as important as all my, I don't care, VIP speakers. I'm just, I just love to have them to be part of it. I think that goes a long way, which I never expected. Before. I've seen the genuine issue, like, um, like my aunt. Um, <laughs> Peter? I would just suggest dare to do something very different, okay, because Every event has what's common to all of them in terms of promotion, structure, website, you know, email blast, you know, whatever. But do something different that makes you stand out, that people will remember you and, and you know, just give you that little extra edge. Um, you know, I can't even imagine what, th what things, but, you know, just use your imagination and uh, do something really cool. That kind of dovetails on what you were talking about, Ben, but uh, hopefully you didn't steal your thunder. Go. Ride in on a panda. <laughs> I don't know get, if I can talk that. Get, get a panda and that. ride in on it. Right. I don't care how you do it, please do it. <laughs> wow. I don't Lastly, can I just ask one more thing? I think if you're having a big event, make sure it doesn't conflict with another huge event. So you're not yes, I agree event. with that. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that before. For the same All line. the time. Yes. <laughs> I agree. Well, I think that will, that will do it. I really thank you guys for some fantastic insight. I know this is a huge topic. This really calls for basically a series of talks to cover each of these aspects. But thank you for giving me and giving all of us an idea of what really makes a uh, great event great and how to, how to promote it out there, how to make it memorable for folks. And, uh, so can we give this panel a round of applause? And